Hello and welcome to IRC Chapter 3, The Human Element. This is the first session of three about safety glazing in Section 308. Now the IRC identifies hazardous areas where there's a higher likelihood that someone will slip, fall, or otherwise impact nearby glass within certain proximities. And we all know glass is hazardous. I'm going to start at Section 308.3, Human Impact Loads. This section clarifies that glazing proximity is based on individual glazing panels, not the entire window assembly. It also references the subsection for the safety glazing test standards, but provides three overall exceptions. The first is louvered windows in accordance with section 308.2. These do not require safety glazing. Now this section limits the glass pieces to 48 inches long, 3 16 of an inch thick, and they have to have smooth edges. A subsection to this makes it clear that wired glass can't have any exposed wire on the edges. Glass mirrors are applicable to safety glazing requirements, but not when they're continuously backed, like on a wall. The hazard is greatly reduced when body parts can't actually go through the glazing or mirror. And lastly, glass unit masonry. Again, if your body and body parts can't go through it and can't even break it, well, it's not going to be the same kind of hazard that this section is trying to reduce. The subsection provides two safety glazing test standards and where they're applicable. But this is going to get pretty heavy when we dig into this. So let's do a little history lesson first and understand why there's two standards and why we're at where we are in the code today. The hazard of glass in areas where more likely to fall was first recognized in the 1964 Uniform Building Code, and it called out specific glass types that were approved, tempered glass being one of them. Now, tempered glass is so prevalent of a choice today that it has become synonymous with safety glazing, to the point where many inspectors will inappropriately write tempered glass required on their inspection reports. Don't ever do that or you as a government authority are making a decision that's not yours to make. It belongs to the citizen. You can certainly suggest the ease of tempered glass, but be clear. Now, in 1966, an ANSI standard was published that provided a test methodology to evaluate what makes something safety glazing. Now, this always reminds me of a radio station. You're listening to Z97.1. ANSI Radio. Well, anyway, you see in the 1975 edition of the Cabo 1 and 2 Family Dwelling Code that Z97.1 is referenced for safety glazing. Now, how many of you are thinking of a Chevy truck? Or some of you may be a particular computer motherboard, huh? All right, let's get back to being serious. Now, the federal government stepped in the, uh, through the Consumer Product Safety Commission in 1977, and they enacted Part 1201 of CFR 16, one of their standards. And this established a different test standard for safety glazing, as well as scoping for when it's required in specific door and shower enclosures. So in the 1983 edition of the Cabo Code, you see that the ANSI reference is gone and the Consumer Product Safety Commission standard is now referenced. You see, the Cabo Code couldn't, I, could identify additional locations where safety glazing is required, but couldn't override the federal standard for safety glazing or the door and, lo and enclosure locations that it specified. So this basically lasted until the 2009 IRC, where you now see both, standard listed, both standards listed. The ANSI standard was revised and brought back into the code where appropriate, because it didn't match the Consumer Product Safety Commission standard. So this brings us to what we see in the IRC today, which are two somewhat confusing tables of standards, categories, and locations. The first table is the federal standard, which is the leading requirement. It has two different categories that we'll discuss later. The second table is an exception where the ANSI standard can be used for locations that are not already addressed by the federal standard. Now, this is what I will unpack and explain in this course session because that's how the code is currently written. 
But notice the year of the Consumer Product Safety Commission standard that's referenced in the 2021 IRC. It's 2002. In the 2002 edition, Section 1201.4 Test Procedures provided pages of details for the test method, and these are the methods that differed from the ANSI method 20 years ago. However, if you read the current Consumer Product Safety Commission Part 1201 standard, it's been updated many times since 2002. The last time was here in 2022. And it no longer provides any test procedures at all, and ones that don't differ from ANSI. In fact, it actually now references the Z97.1 ANSI standard for the test methodology. And it references the 2015 edition of the ANSI standard. But just to further complicate things, if we look at the reference in the IRC for the ANSI standard, it's to the 2014 edition. You know, I think overall some things need to be updated in the IRC. But for now, let's just take what is confusing so far and let's start digging into the code 308.3.1, the current code. Now, as I mentioned already, the leading requirement is testing in accordance with the federal standard. But you can see it references to the category two of that standard, unless otherwise indicated in table 308.3.1 that we had just looked at. Now, before we go to that table, let's look at the test assembly for the standards. The same assembly is depicted in each standard, or it was before the methodology was deleted from the federal one. The glass is held here in the assembly, and a leather bag, like a punching bag, is filled with 100 pounds of lead shot. It's called the impactor. There are two levels of impact in each standard. And just to make it more complicated, the Consumer Product Safety Commission standard category one is, e is equal to the ANSI class B. Now this is a lighter impact from an elevation dropping of 18 inches. The impactor is on a five foot cable and is released from a height of 18 inches to swing down into the glass. Category two, psi or class A is for more impact. The impactor is raised all the way up to 48 inches, and it's released from this point to impact the glass. So you can clearly get a feel for how much greater impact is anticipated in this class versus the previous. And so you can see in the Consumer Product Safety Commission standard where it specifies the different categories based on the products and the glazing sizes. Now, when we go to the reference table in the IRC, it captures all of the federal requirements, the federal locations for doors and enclosures, plus all the other hazardous locations identified by IRC, so that you could simply use this standard if you wanted to. Now, remember, the federal government is only addressing doors and shower and bathtub enclosures. So these are the three door locations and the enclosure locations. And the trigger that differentiates the different categories or classes of the standards, the drop height, is nine square feet of glass or less or more than nine square feet. Now there's the exception to this federal standard. The exception allows the use of the ANSI standard only for the locations not identified by the federal standard. So these two locations can utilize glaze, safety glazing tested under ANSI. But you see them up here as well because they could also use the federal standard. Now, there's one con condition in enclosures that's not actually covered by the federal standard. So the ANSI standard picks that up down here. All right, with that, let's go back to that exception and actually read it this time. It specifically lists the federal locations where this ex exception can't be used. Okay, that's glazing that's not indoors or enclosures for hot tubs, whirlpools, saunas, steam rooms, bathtubs, and showers. If it's not there, you can use the ANSI standard. Okay, so let's look at this unique condition for the hazardous location of enclosures. This is for glazing by wet surfaces. And let's see what the ANSI standard can apply to. Notice the footnote A right here. We read this footnote, it states the use, this use is permitted only by the exception to 308.3.1. That's what we just looked at. 
So let's bring that exception in and let's look at this list of features compared to the features in the hazardous location because at first read it, it almost seems identical and this doesn't make sense. But what you find is that the federal standard doesn't address swimming pool enclosures. So the ANSI standard, that will cover that here. This portion is only for pool enclosures. Now, after all that, truthfully, tempered glass is the simple go-to for safety glazing that makes this easy. It will apply to all of these conditions and to the 48 inch drop. But when it comes to building code education, the goal isn't to make things easy. The goal is to reveal the requirements precisely. This minimizes regulation and maximizes freedom. The definition in the ANSI standard makes it clear what the purpose for safety glazing is, not just the types of safety glazing. It defines it as glazing materials so constructed, treated, or combined with other materials that if broken by human contact, the likelihood of cutting or piercing injuries that might result from such contact is reduced. So there's a lot of critical terms in there to realize just how much freedom there is in safety glazing materials. Remember here, if the glass doesn't break or doesn't collapse, it's not likely to cut or pierce us. And that's gonna bring us to some of the other options on the market, including proprietary security films designed to keep people from being able to break through your windows. Now these often comply with the standards for safety glazing because they're able to receive that impact without collapse. Now as a totally random example, I was quickly able to find a product online with technical specifications listing compliance to both the federal and ANSI standard. Now of course outside of an example, if a product like this is to be used, you need to more fully evaluate it and the installation requirements. All right, now let's back up to 308.1 and talk about identification of safety glazing. How do we know if glazing is safety glazed? It is. Just write it on the window. No, that's just a joke. But this was actually a really helpful builder that also put an arrow here to the corner, simply trying to communicate with me and help me find this label, this etching on the window. These can be hard to find sometimes. And so what this is, is the manufacturer's designation. And this is what's required for identification. It has to specify who applied it, the type of glass, and the standards that it applies to. Now going to the code section, we see that the choices for this designation are acid etched, sandblasted, ceramic fired, laser etched, or embossed. And <laughs> And I don't know if I can imagine a tempered glass window being embossed with this information, but uh, send me a photo if you find one, please. The other option that's provided is a type of designation that once applied cannot be removed without being destroyed. And that statement about being destroyed is to require a type of glass, a type of label that cannot be removed unless it's were torn apart, just destroyed. It can't be removed intact like we're seeing here to where it could be placed on another piece of glass. Now, this goes along with the next sentence that says a label can be used in lieu of the manufacturer's designation. And a label is defined in the IRC and it requires the same information as the designation and much more. Now this can be a nice in situations where a permanent etching would not be aesthetically pleasing, like say the glass on a fireplace near a bathtub. And no, I realize this is not helpful for future identification of the glazing, but it is what the minimum code allows for. Uh, sorry to the home inspectors. Now this section also states that for other than tempered glass, a manufacturer's designation or a label is not required. When a certificate, affidavit, or other evidence is provided that can be used to verify that the product meets the safety glazing requirements. This is the avenue used when those window film products are chosen. The subject, this or the subsection is about assemblies with multiple panes of glass and how we identify them, such as a door like this. When the panes don't exceed one square foot maximum each, 
only one is required to have the complete designation, and the others can be identified only by the standard. My name is Glenn Mathewson. Thanks for learning with me. This course has been provided to you by BuildingCodeCollege.com, where we go beyond the words.